so before I get into that, let me just say where I met Layla. I met her at the uh, Free Rider for Media. Like a few years ago, a friend of mine was doing an uh, anarchist radio show. And um, she was guesting there. And I heard her analysis of some like the crisis, the environmental crisis, uh, education, the way that she really has such a comprehensive view of the problems facing our society and like, how we can fix them. And it was really engaging and like very compelling. And um, I think that her book that she just brought out is really like groundbreaking. <clears throat> and Shulkin said, I'm, I'm really sorry about this, sorry if it seems like a problem, but, but uh, I don't really facilitate very well. So thank you, let's do it for me. Okay, yeah, first. Thank you for saying that great tip. I feel like this is too noisy now, but I guess I'm completely lowering it. Well, I can speak louder because but I don't want to see it too loud. Can people hear me then afterwards? Oh, okay. Can you hear? Am I speaking too low? Okay. So to make this a little interactive, can people throw out uh, things that we are oppressed by in our society, problems that we are facing, forms of oppression and stuff like that, just randomly throw out stuff? Capitalism. Uh, centralization is like the best way to think of 
problems. Basically, I think what David is saying in her analysis is like all of the or many of the ills that we're facing in our society can be traced back to the education system. And people often look at education as being like a, a benign or basically a you know this neutral aspect of life. But what we're kind of getting at is that when you look at things like colonization, uh, cultural genocide. The, the system that we're living under is like a monoculture. And every other way of learning has been basically almost eradicated. And we are basically left with one system, one type of education, a Western education. And in order for our system to perpetuate itself, of course, it has to perpetuate itself through the education system. And so we'll get more into that. And sorry, this is like the game that's so But everyone gets like the general for us to where we're coming from. And one reason why I think this is like really important is because recently I was involved with uh, colonization. I went down to Black Mesa and saw um, a lot of the oppression that people are facing on the reservation. And you know, everyone here is sort of I don't work and the Native American resurgence. Quickly, um, I know Sasha already mentioned that you 
are a way to perpetuate the society. Um, at the same time, um, we have thousands of students in Philly that are walking out of classes, and um, you know, so there's a need for working class based education for young people to become aware of the, of the world that they live in and uh, figure out how to like act in it. Um, but the capitalist system has obviously failed to provide a model of education that does that. So for me, it's like, how do we develop a radical criticism of education as basically just an extension of the state, while at the same time not dismissing those young high school kids that are walking out of classes because they want a real education, and they want you know, an education that's going to help them become participants in society. So yeah, I'm interested in exploring that right now. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, I teach at a local high school, and it's like, the worst experience of my life. And I kind of went in with the <laughs> idea of like, okay, it's more about what you teach, and maybe how you do the lessons, or you, know, you just got to give them the right stuff. And that's, in my experience, been like crap. It's, you can't, just because you're teaching them, something and throwing in like a radical idea or, or making it like a worthwhile project, it's not real to them. Um, and especially like I teach math, so, um, which I think is like a really powerful tool, but if you don't care or know why it's that way, I can't just say, oh, you're going to use it. It's okay. Everybody's going to use it. That doesn't, I mean, I, I know from my experience that doesn't make it matter. So. You're interested to share, like, but um, why are you interested in evaluating critical education? You don't have to if you don't want to. No, I completely am. Um, I like I like the way Sylvia Federici tends to focus on uh, production and reproduction. And I mm -hmm. think schools are like a nexus of uh, producing workers who are disciplined to listen to, to follow instructions and whatnot, and um, I know that there are alternatives to that. I think what we need to do while offering the critique is also create uh, alternatives, and it's I think important to do both. But that's why. Okay. Well, it's um, yeah. So uh, it, it's great convergence. I hear you know some people are interested in the teaching aspect. Others uh, feel this they went to get a kind of a package of knowledge that was going to help them and um, it obviously is not working. Uh, someone wants to go uh, for the learning experience. Um, and so um, I would like you to think about this from the perspective that um, how long have we had education and how long have we had cities? Okay. What is schooling? What is obligatory schooling? And since we're here in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, <laughs> obviously, um, many, uh, for some reason, and we know very specific reasons. We've we've heard them. You know all the oppressions are not embraced by that brotherly love. So, um, they are ousted, uh, they are ghettoized, they are left behind, no matter what you know, politicians say, no one will be left behind, no one is left behind, no one was left behind. You know, um, obviously there is this injustice already um, in our city dwellings, and it's very much linked with education. So I'd like to think, how do you think it is linked? How long have you had cities? And what is education? So cities, as we know them today, are, well, especially in, um, in North America, um, well, they came with colonization from Europe and with industrialization. And schools, Obligatory schooling, has anyone read the, uh, John Taylor Gatto or David Nassau? There are some like, good historians, have you heard? That sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. 
Uh, okay, uh, John Taylor Gatto in the Amer underground uh, Amer history of American education, and David Nassau is a historian of education. Um, they traced the school to actually, it's a very new project um, that is uh, the obligatory. We're not talking about sharing of information or say like, you know, the, um, I will get to the critique of say, you know, the, the civilized philosopher schools in Greece or, you know, the Arab schools, you know, the Qutab and, um, and these, like, they're much older, but they weren't obligatory, okay? They were like the monasteries, they were elitist confiscation of knowledge. So the obligatory schooling is a phenomenon of modern industrialization and not only that, because what is linked to industrialization? Colonization. Colonization, uh, first of all, of city dwellings, depending on the countryside, and at a certain point where European nationalism started getting born, it became a war of colonization of the world, outside of our little nation domain. Like if before it was the peasant and the land, then conglomeration of peasants and the lord, the landlord, then the king and the kingdom, and then you see the tendency of um, colonized uh, constant expansion and constant need to extract resources from out, outer and outer and outer territories until then you clash with the neighbors. So for John Taylor Gatto, the problem of colonization started with Any more yeah, the basement. Okay. The problem of colonization started with um, of schooling, actually. It started it during the war between Germany and France uh, with the philosopher Fichte who announced that it's, um, uh, okay, the Germans uh, lost the war to the French because the French had standard, like they were organized, they had standard instructions and uh, the Germanic uh, tribes were further north as civilization and colonization was marching from the south, from the Mediterranean, from the Middle East to the Mediterranean before that, so like we're going further and further in history to the birth of civilization itself. And as it is marching further north and civilization needing more to conquer, the response of the Germans, if we are going to stand to these civilizing wars, we have to get organized. And what do we, what do we need in order to get organized? We need... machines to kill, like 
yeah, the military is part of it. But um, what happens with the mines, with the industrialization, where the parents are overworked, the kids are on the street, you need to put them into schools to make them into obedient workers. Somebody already mentioned that before. And so, um, when you think of the project itself of uh, education, um, in many ways, as in the form and the structure that it, it has taken today, uh, you cannot extract it from its original purpose, which is obedience, and which is actually, it was never meant, the industrialists never meant to have the Irish kids who landed in Montreal become rich. They needed to exploit the, the labor, so they needed them as resources. So the project, from the start, is not to give them the tools to, to make a better living for themselves, it's to make them the tools for capitalist production. Okay? And, and that's just the, the last couple of centuries. Um, apart from, from this problem of, um, um, of today's expression of, uh, of contemporary schooling, of literary schooling, and we, which we see, like, we see public schools, we see private schools. Um, it's not the knowledge itself that gets transmitted that empowers, it's what is already in the class. So the city schools, have they ever have done well? Have they ever given the tools for its children to grow up and do well in the world? Like if you if you start looking at the history itself, what is success? And um, um, and sometimes like prof like you know the, the the teachers here obviously you know want something better, want justice, want to empower their, you know uh, the children that they're dealing with. But very often in the administrations, professors, uh, university professors or high school administrators or teachers. Um, acknowledge the fact that actually you don't want to open the doors of critique because who will sell sausages? Who will clean the floors? You can't have them read Akhmatova and Svitaeva and learn like uh, Baudelaire and dream of, uh, of the tomb, like uh, lost time, you know? Um, they need to, to be resources. And so that's the, to, today's expression of, uh, of, of education. I want you to go further back and think, why is it so? Like, what, what makes it domesticating and disempowering from its very conception, inception? Anyone has any suggestions? How far can we go to really question the root of education? What is education? What does it entail? What does it entail to educate? If I am coming here, if, if I go to your place, knock, open the door, I'm coming here to educate you. How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. It's 
It's very different if you come to me okay. and say, I want to learn. But if I come to you and I say, I want to teach you, you'll tell me, ciao. I was like, yeah, yeah. who are you, right? Okay, so what is it? So you're right, you're on the right track. What does it presume? Like, what, what it is. It assumes that you're not educated. Right? Okay, but you don't know. And if you don't know, what happened to that knowledge? You see, this is what I want you to think. What happened to that knowledge? Why, you sh why should you know what I know? And how come I know something that you don't know? Okay, several things happening here. One is, if I really do have the knowledge that you don't have, it means that I have commodified it and taken it away from you. That I made sure that I will be able to impose my knowledge on my terms and that you don't have access to it. Okay, so you already have, at the basis of the concept of education, you have disempowerment. Okay? Yes? A little other than to that, as I heard that the lecture was invented because textbooks weren't available in, in mass production at the time. So in order to get that information out, you had to have somebody lecture it to an audience because that person had to kind of read it and kind of commodify it. So it's like, even before schooling, just the, the fact that we couldn't pre reproduce those books was the invention of what teaching is, basically. And, and that's... And they're saying that online, online learning is that next step. It's like, oh, well, now you don't even need that person. We can just give you a video now. Absolutely. And before that, what happened before that? Who had the knowledge before that? The aristocrats. Yeah. The aristocrats. The class. <laughs> the, who kept, who, who so wrote the, the knowledge, knowledge is always being a commodity, so it's always, mm -hmm. well, well, not well, always, but well, for a long time. For yes. a long time, because yes. even before what you're saying about obligatory education, like if I know from my own culture, if I go back to like the most ancient of like Irish literature, it's mostly either by like priestesses and exactly. social religion, so it's like, it's like the Book of Kells, which is like, so old and it's written by monks and so it's always being controlled it's always being something that people don't want everybody to know because let's face it but there hasn't been always it has been like that ever since the civilization has marched and colonized the gales and imposed literacy and by imposing literacy what happens is that you you take away the knowledge you codify the knowledge and the, and your relationship to the knowledge becomes a different experience itself. Yes. I, I, have, I, have, a, I have a similar example in, in my experience, um, actually to what, 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 what you referred to when you brought up the question of, um, or brought, brought, brought the um, situation of, um, I'm here to educate you. I was actually confronted once some um, several years ago by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses when they came to my door um, once and I actually was um, caught unaware of what was going on until I saw them and I realized, well, it's, it's a little too late to just, um, to, to just overtly ignore and I didn't want to be rude. <laughs> so, so, so what, what I did was um, I let them talk, I let them talk for, um, and what I, what I was thinking in my mind was I pretty much knew what, um, the gist of what they were going to tell me and, and and so I thought, okay, without being rude, um, I'll find a way to bring it to a closure. And so, because everything they told me for, for one thing, I was I was pretty much aware of. Because the the goal is to get is to get you to um, to join them, and I, I realized that. So what I did was I said, um, I actually got to get going and. Then they started to offer me material, and so what I did was I claimed that I had it already. <laughs> and so they were actually satisfied. They said, oh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and they were on their way. And I, and I, and I, did, and I didn't have, have, have to um, deal with any further information that I didn't necessarily need. Yeah, exactly. And, um... I mean, I, I realize that's maybe that might be a bit of an extreme example, but um, that, was, that was one thing I remember. But it, it's also it, it's linked to the to the priests, 
to the imposition of knowledge and we will be getting to the whole point of education and domestication. You wanted to say something? Um, kind of related um, to what was being said about the priest it, uh, is I'm like reading a lot of Bordeaux. It's a really Bordeaux. It helps to be like uh, Max Weber. Bourdieu, you mean? Or, yeah, I don't speak French. Or, like, <laughs> Pierre. Pierre, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But there was talk of, like, uh, cultural capital, specifically, exactly. uh, as an example, we're using uh, religion. And then religion is, like, the religious figures had this capital, this uh, um, divine right or knowledge or whatever, and everyone else doesn't. So it, that, that cultural capital is now just the material capital, because it it affects your experience in mm -hmm. the society. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's all the points connect perfectly. Uh, now, uh, to go to the point of not education, but what is knowledge? Why do we need knowledge? Why do we need to learn something? What is it that we learn? What is it that the schooling project tells us that it's going to teach us? Yes. Well, a lot of people would say that um, we need it to survive, like to learn how, like, a, like if you break your leg or arm, we need a doctor to treat you, or you need to learn how to make machines, or uh, there's so many different technical things that we have to learn, and mm -hmm. so we need schools for that. That's, I think, it's a common answer to that question. Yeah, and like what. Uh Usually, what the parents or teachers say to the kids who don't do the homework? What's the reprimand? What's the threat? You're going to be poor. I'm so worried. Is that? And what happens when you're like, Mr. Young, he's not lying. He's like, so not angry. That's exactly. And what happens when you're poor? Oh. And not only that, you starve. Okay? So here's like already like this schizophrenic dynamic. Okay? So the knowledge is taken, commodified, privatized, taken away, and then you're told you need that knowledge or you'll die or you'll be poor, you'll starve. And then if you don't do what the pedagogue wants you to do, or how the pedagogue wants you, pedagogue is the teacher, right? Wants you to learn. The pedagogue or the teacher or the domesticator, what does, what does she or he do? They actually ensure that the student starves, right? How, yes? Why is it taken away as opposed to just being um, like as scarce but in the hands of the elders? The necessary knowledge. Like who are the elders? It's like old people's society because education is for younger people. So, so you're born without knowing the resources. In non-domestic in non-domestic domesticated societies, this is precisely how like the assumption is that children all children, human and non-human, are born hardwired to learn in the community of life. Diverse community of diverse ages, diverse tastes, diverse, you know, uh, likes, dislikes, uh, you know, um, forms of life around you. Okay, so so that is precisely what happens in what happens in um, in a city school. How do children? How do children learn in a city school? They're dictated. It's it's a dictation of the things that the people who are standing in the front door think that they should know, what, or rather yes. that the state says that they have to exactly. know. Exactly. What happens to the kids uh, who don't go to school, and if they don't have official papers that they're homeschooled, that someone is watching what they've learned? Locked up. Locked up. The cops. Okay, so if it's a thing about learning how to live, we are going back to the German project. How come 
cops are after the kids who don't go to school. Okay? You see the connection? And we're not, like, no, nobody tells us this, but it's part of the whole mechanism that is taken for granted. And someone here, read Pierre Bourdieu, I'm really happy because he's one of my favorite sociologists, you know, on, on how we reenact constantly these narratives, these schemas, without even articulating them. The doxa, you know, the hidden knowledge that is not being said, but everybody kind of knows it goes by itself, out of itself. Yes? I think building off of that and on the question mm -hmm. was, for me, it's a question of what knowledge is being uh, transmitted, because I think, like you said, in like a non-domesticated uh, mm -hmm. culture, people are learning the skills of life and the skills of survival and community, but largely in you know uh, standard Western schools, what you're learning is irrelevant, abstract information that has no connection at all to your culture, community, or survival. So I think that's that relates to like the question of why is knowledge like taken away? It's, it's like, well, what knowledge are they even trying to impose? It's mostly uh, garbage. Absolutely. <laughs> and not only, it's absolutely, like, you articulated it perfectly. Um, in a living community of diversity, mm -hmm. children, again, animal and human children, tune into the knowledge of life. They are part of that community of life. They make sure that it lives. And they learn how to live and to help life be because they know if the community around dies, if the water is dead, everyone is dead, right? And so then we're going back to now more, much more than a metaphor to the project of death in Germany, okay? So not only is it founded on creating machines of death, the kind of knowledge that gets imparted now is the knowledge of death. And literacy, in my book, I talk, like I draw on, on, on some uh, anthropological research on actually how literacy alters our brain because our memory doesn't work the same way. And I compare the Somali, I worked, uh, um, did comparative uh, uh, medical, uh, like knowledge of illness and health in, in Europe. I compared the Somali and the Swiss, centralized, you know, and, uh, illiterate societies, how you, how, how you conceive of illness and health themselves is so radically different because, you know, your living community is part of the life, of your memory. And once your memory, and that is what the Somalis keep saying, like your, your landlord doesn't even come to, to, you know, to look you in the eye, send you a piece of paper, that's a dead landlord, like I'm not even going to bother paying. <laughs> You know, because it's a relationship of not debt, but of exchange of energy of life. Okay, and literacy is again, I, you know, I draw on Pierre Bourdieu also and uh, um, on uh, Jack Goody how the economy of debt is part of how literacy came about. The first lists that were recorded were not poetry. We're not like stargazing and thinking about you know the creation. They were actually um, came with civilization, and civilization is domestication of living beings on a plot of land, and then forcing like killing all competition and forcing the resources to work and tying them to ownership by lists of debt. You owe the landlord. It becomes that kind of relationship and it alters that like, even the physiology of the brain itself changes. Like you're a literate person is a different person. Like you can rewire, it's not hopeless, <laughs> but, um, but it has like a very powerful effect on our uh, physiology. Yes. I think it's just also like what we're doing now with some problems with education, like it's also like a way that you like look at the world around you and you get tools to like actually see what's actually going on and um, I guess just like 
for someone who's alone, like it can be like something to make you feel like you're not crazy. So I guess just I feel like you're reading for you and like that's I don't know, that's also knowledge, that's also education. Um, yeah, but uh, Bourdieu did not, like why are you reading it, because you're interested or because someone told you? I didn't tell you for sure, but I um, recommend <laughs> Um. Well, one thing I like is, I like how uh, much attention he gives to uh, uh, biases in terms of mm -hmm. interpreting things. Mm -hmm. Like seeing like mm -hmm. reflecting on what your own perspective might bring to <clears throat> your interpretations of things. So, but did someone force you to it or you chose? Oh, no. Exactly. So you see, that's the difference. That's that's what um, also too. Like it's the difference is that of course we learn and we learn in dialogue. I mean, we're here conversing, and obviously we're going to exchange. But it's a totally different dynamic. If I'm going to tell you, you're going to starve. If you're not going to come to my classes and do as I, I know what I think you should know, and forget about everything else. You see, and this is what education is about, and this is. And then, you know, to go further back to the whole inception of the concept of civilization. Because for me, education is a project of civilizing. And what is civilization? Yeah? Well, that, um, this relates also to the question of why something is taken away as opposed to only existing. Um, and like I'm trying to like actually like answer that, try to resolve that, and I think it's that it's not so much that it's not necessarily uh, dependent on the assumption that what you think you know and what they think you should know is different. It's also about the verification. It's making sure that that is what you think is true, and so I think mm -hmm. uh, what actually you don't have automatically is legitimacy. I think that's why it's something can be like you cannot have it in certain legitimate people can give it to you. In education, okay, so I'll, we'll go back to the um, uh, civilization, uh, definition of civilization. This is a very important point because, yeah, and it ties in with Bourdieu and with the symbolic capital. And this is also why uh, I want you to think that, um, and look at the statistics of, regardless of whether schools, in poor neighborhoods shut down or continue to go on, regardless of whether um, if you are of minority status, and that's like, again, a social artificial construct precisely to disempower, to put you in a certain category, and this is how civil, we'll go back to civilization, how civilization wants us to think, people, of humans, of plants, everything is in a category, usable, resource, um, and <coughs> the knowledge itself, even if you, you know Bourdieu, would your knowledge of Bourdieu have the same exchange rate as a guy who graduated from Harvard, you see? Uh, because what goes with that is the symbolic capital attached to who knows. And this is what Bourdieu is really good. It's like, it's not like even at this point what you know. Because like, knowledge of how we live in the wilderness, in the Middle Ages, more or less has been uh, monopolized, destroyed, capitalized. Now it's the doctor, it's not the witch, you know, it's not the midwife, it's... Uh, um, and so, not only does the knowledge itself get uh, monopolized, its exchange rate is different. And that's completely linked to civilization. And what is civilization in terms, I want to think of it not as a quality, you know, well, you know, civilization is when we evolve towards, you know, I don't know, brighter future. What is, um, in an anthropological sense, what does it mean to be civilized? Where does civilization come from? Yes. Agriculture, urbanization. Exactly. Social hierarchy. Exactly. <coughs> also conformity. 
And what, what is agriculture?
the human predator. You start, you invent predation. You invent a cycle of predation, the food cycle, the food chain. Okay. Um, so with the food chain, of course, who is the ultimate predator? Who has the right? Because he has the brain. Is the human. Okay. So it becomes all naturalized, and then you can have two versions. You could have for those who, who click with science, you could say, well, you know, it's like it all happened like that, nature, coincidence, look, you observe, you know, came from the, from the water, um, you know, this is how things, then you have the whole Darwinian narrative, but it kind of reconfirms colonization, predation, violence, and rape. And reproduction of resources because then the Darwinian narrative tells us what tells us that well, um, a species success is measured by how much it reproduces, how successful it is, its strategies for reproduction. Yeah, um, that's kind of insensitive to like species that are like asexual. Yeah, that's saying that they're not successful evolutionarily. Yeah, but even if, well, yeah, um, uh, you can say so. But, you know, this is how the narrative then, you know, formulates it. And then you start focusing on what? That it's natural to reproduce. And I'm getting to that how this whole civilization is based on these concepts that you have. To, you start thinking of reproduction, it's like women, women have to reproduce, that's the species success. And that's the scientific narrative. The religious narrative tells you basically the same story, except that, well, you know, God created the heavens, God created the earth, um, and said, well, spread the seed and reproduce and, and consume and blah, blah, blah. If you read the, the Old Testament, it's actually not as to your faith, like how the evolution of, of the religious text itself goes through uh, the time to incorporate these notions. It, it originally was much more non-domesticated in the sense that, well, humans and animals were created on the same day. Um, uh, the humans were told by God, you know, eat seeds and don't compete. And then it evolves. But we get to this point of that reproduction is really important. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, about this reproduction, like when you're talking about that now, I'm thinking about how in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods, like around Sample and West Coast, yeah, everywhere you go now, you see cranes, you see new buildings coming up. And I think this is related to what you're talking about, like capitalism, cities, it's always about new production expanding more and more and more. Like that's the whole object. More of the same. Yeah. It's more not more of the same. same. And this is when you look at. Uh, when you look at non-domesticated societies, nomadic societies, gatherer societies, that are completely left out from, from both of these narratives, the scientific and monotheistic, which is you know Christian, Jewish, and Islamic, they basically have you know the same narrative, you know, at its base. Um, so you get uh, the the idea that well, you know, that's that you know that's what needs to be done. It's natural expansion, and with that, what happens is that um, the birth rate, the fertility, is increased by the narrative itself. And you look at nomadic gatherer societies who still exist today. You know, miraculously haven't been all destroyed, but those like massive destruction happened like in the last 100, 200 years, especially. With the conquest of, of the Americas and colonization of Africa, and you see their population growth always remained at zero, stable. Okay? And so you immediately see how uh, consumption, rape, murder, colonization, colonization of the purpose of being, of who you are going to domesticate and construct as either your labor resource or your food are all linked with the needs of civilization, the growth of population, of monoculturalism, of one species, at the expense of everything else, of, of the diversity. And 
with that, the, the death of biodiversity. Okay, and the imposition of one narrative, this narrative. You, you have. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, what could agree that we do and yet be worried that we are romanticizing nature? Um, I mean, I could assume that one could see nature as already having rape and murder all around. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm just worried about, like, as if that state of nature ever existed, that, that idea, and, and then civilization came like, murdered and murdered. What's the age of the earth? environment, 
um, in terms of the abuse that is happening like on an unprecedented scale. Um, so obviously, you look at the school project and you're all here because it has not responded to your needs. It has failed you. And I want you to think about it like, well, why has it failed you? Is it because, well, this is just one school bad? Is it just Philadelphia that is bad? Like, what happens in London? What happens in Khartoum? You know, what is being sold? What is being taken? This is what I want you to question and think about. It. My book proposes certain like um, areas of research, certain answers, but obviously it's like I don't have the final answers. It's it's what we find. Yeah. I'm just thinking in response to Chloe's question. I don't know. One thing that's always strikes me whenever like students speak out, and I think that is a kind of education itself, because that's like a changing of the dynamic. It's a changing of the narrative. It's like this is what's happening to you, and you have to accept it as a passive participant. And I think like I think if anything, we can think of it as kind of like an opening for like a different kind of education, or like thinking about struggle as a kind of education. Um, but yeah, I, I do I do think that's really important and. That's something I'm struggling with, is like this defense of public education. And it was, yeah, as you say, it's like, it's not to, for you to say that it's an answer. Yeah. Be down on. I offered the students where I thought, like, played with the idea of teaching uh, future teachers um, to critique education in, in Quebec. And uh, I made sure that. Uh, you know, if, if they could afford to support the authors that are living, but the rest of the text to get them online uh, for free. And they actually went and complained that I was telling them like some weird stuff about that knowledge should be free and how come I'm investing, and it's not even as expensive. The education in Quebec is the cheapest in North America. It's like, you know, even for you as international students, it would still be like three times cheaper. For Quebecois, it's like, you know, but, you know, the level of living there is low, so it kind of it still ends up being expensive, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is that, like, compared to what, you know, you would have to pay here, it's not even that much. And they are already invested in the idea that if I can afford to buy this package now, you better make sure that I buy it because how, like what, she wants us to go and give it for free to our students? Like, is that crazy? You know? So, so the, the concept itself with the students is, is, is part of what Bourdieu said, you know, this, this pyramid structure, that this is a capital, it's an investment, has nothing to do with giving you the tools to live, or to live, in a, or to, but it's an exchange currency. And you better like invest in it now, because the dividends will be much higher, and if it comes to anarchists and says you can get it all off and share it for free, no, 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 it doesn't work. Okay, so, so even like a lot of the students get into this domesticating um, relationship to knowledge and mentality. Yes. Um, I want to make a point of alluding actually specifically to one thing that you want to say about about, about the um, about the construction going on, for instance, in West Philadelphia and in other parts of the city too. I last year was at an event called the Site Exchange, which was at the um, Fox's school temple, and what they, um, the, the whole idea of um, the discussion was about um, urban development as far as um, what can be done to improve um, quality of life as far as the air we breathe, the environment we live in, um, what, um, what we eat, uh, and, and just and how we live day to day. And this was, and ideas were um, introduced on the terms of um, building designs, schools, uh, urban farming, and what 
And actually, what I actually noticed, and from all the talks, there was one pattern I, I, I noticed that I finally had to raise my hand and ask about. And what I noticed on, specifically to what, um, in reference to what you were saying, was that most of the innovations I could tell were really only ones that would benefit those that had money. And that, that was kind of some, that was something that I that concerned me, realizing that as great as the, these ideas are for um, for for our for our environment, and just and just for um and for, for the ground we live on, most of these ideas are are things are ideas that very few people can really can really share and can buy into. You mean people with money who are like already invested in the educational system that they probably have a degree or an advanced degree. Yeah. So they're allowed to take part in that because they've already like put in something to that system. So now they're getting like dividends from it basically. You know? This that that's what I got. I mean that, mm -hmm. that was the impression I got out of that, because that that's because it made it only made sense to me that um, that only those that actually had had the capital and know how, how to do this would be the ones that would benefit from it and no one else. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking, okay, so I actually asked, so what can be done to address um, and to include those who are un who are financially underprivileged and and don't ha don't have the necessary um, resources. Or as I would say like financial victims. Like you use this term like underprivileged and like mm -hmm. I, I like what you say in your book that that's just like a code word for like victims of society basically. Mm -hmm. And it's like no one wants to be called a victim, but like that's basically what you are when you're underprivileged, you know. Right. So I mean under this paradigm a little bit. So. Sure. Yeah. And see I, the one thing I wanted to end with on, on that on that point was that um the one the one um the, the, the one the one talk, the one innovation that I actually thought did work successfully as far as something that everybody could share it was it was urban farming because mm -hmm. that 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 was something that did serve those from pretty much all, all walks of life economically and yeah. that one <laughs> yeah um, I, I guess I wanted to try to steer the conversation back towards sort of solutions what do we do um, building off of sort of what Chloe and mm -hmm. Megan were saying um, yeah there's like this tension between uh, needing to survive within the system that exists and needing to have a certain amount of access to resources just to survive mm -hmm. versus needing to overthrow and transform the structure of society. Um, so for example, you feel it really, I feel it really deeply, you know, with this whole school closing thing because the schools in Philadelphia are prisons. They're prisons for the youth. Yes. So, like, why do we want to preserve that? You know? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the, these children need access to resources. They need the ability to survive in society. So, to just take away that access is killing. It's actually lunch for literally. It's, 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 it's not the taking the school. It's not the taking. I agree with you. But I would like you to think that. <coughs> Um, it's not the taking away of the school that's killing them, because the school itself kills. It kills on many different levels. There's the physical threat of rape, there's the physical threat of being shot, there's the physical threat of being medicated, um, of all sorts of, ins that's in addition to all insidious ways of really killing you know, that desire to, to go out and build your community of diversity, okay? No, it has to be monoculture, it has to be gender. Who's going to reproduce? Who's going to be, to manage? Like, you know, the dual gender does not exist in nature. It's a complete civilized concept. And with that comes this whole notion that, well, the construct is there precisely not to, let, to disempower, to dispossess the resources. So if the school is closing down, maybe we should think of it, okay, yeah, there are some, some resources, but 
those kids, the, the percentage of dropouts, the percentage of deaths, the percentage of diseases, because nobody takes care of them, malnutrition, um, are overwhelming. Okay? Not, the school is not going to ever, so it has never solved any, it has never, it was never there to feed. It was there to feed off. Okay? And so, maybe, but yeah, we do need the resources, we do need access to space, we need access to knowledge. And this is what, like, where do we get that knowledge, how do we share that knowledge? Mm -hmm. How do we keep it from being in the schools, in the library, under locks? That, you know, it's only the teacher who tells you, you're going to do, like, page 93 of, you know, biology textbook, and then you, you find out this and this and that, and if you do it, you fail, and if you fail, you know, no scholarships, no college, no money, no this, and that even if everyone gets, like, um, McGill University in Montreal, um, uh, this year they were accepting, uh, uh, I know, like, first-hand information, uh, sociology students, like, 200 applications, five places, and, like, all the top, like, I don't know how many, like, the, the grade point average of, like, 4.0 out of 4.0, it was, like, at least, you know, 20 people. So the grades don't mean anything. Like, how are you going to be selected to participate in that economy of knowledge and unknowledge? Like, it's determined by something completely different, you know? The knowledge itself is only an access to the in-club of what Murtio calls, you know, like, the, you know, who's in the clique and who's going to start. Right. So how are we going to undo that? Like, this workshop, yeah, I don't have the answers. Well, that's kind of what I'm saying, though. It's like, um, you know, in the society, basically, there's different trajectories you could go on. And one trajectory for most people is, in order to survive, you need to earn a wage. You need to sell your labor in order to receive a wage to reproduce yourself. Um, but increasingly, also in this country, for a lot of sort of a lot of these are just being criminalized mm -hmm. and thrown in jail, mm -hmm. and so by closing all these schools, they're increasing the amount of youth that are going to be criminalized. They're criminalizing school already. The, the I, no, I, so, I completely so. agree with your critique of the school, but the problem I'm, I'm just saying it's going from bad to worse. So I uh, I don't necessarily agree that it's going from bad to worse. It's going from bad to bad, you know. Because it's going from bad to bad, they're criminalized in school, they're criminalized outside, you know? So what, this is what, like, you know, if, if you think of, of the school as better than what there is, um, you well, know. It's probably better than jail. I don't know, I mean, not that it's good, it's not good, it's, but it's like, but it's worse, you know? Like, how, but even when the school <coughs> exists, it does not satisfy the needs of how many, mm -hmm kids end up in jail anyways with the school, most probably, more likely with the school in the ghetto because it's neglected, mm -hmm. it's underfunded, they're abused, they're abused on all sorts of levels, they're starved, it's maybe at this point it's better for them to sleep, catch on their sleep at home, you know, there might be like a little bit of pause, they'll be as hungry, but maybe they'll have more sleep, and they won't have like those nagging teachers on their back. Yeah. Uh, Ron, I wanted to. Oh, yeah, I was going to yeah. say something. Sorry, I'm going to tell you how the conversation has sort of shifted to this. And, makes sense. and I think that this is like an important one because, like, like you said earlier, we have, we have to survive you know, mm -hmm. in the system somehow. But one thing I think we might have been bringing into this conversation is the overall crisis that we're living in right now, this moment, mm -hmm. and why yeah. resources are becoming scarce. Um, why it seems that like certain people are getting marginalized like more, and, like the rich are getting greedier and greedier and like eating up everything. And the background of that is like you mentioned in your book, like the extension event that we're going through right now, the housing extension. No one talks about this. This is just like not on anyone's radar screen. Um, the death and destruction that's happening to the, to the planet. Um, this is the background for this. Um, like the people who like the seven billion people is like a lot of people. Unless, unless you just want to like, get rid of them, you have to do something with them. And then people are saying that like, there's not enough... Do you, Ron? 
I mean, you, to. <laughs> to, you know, to the people who are like controlling things, they, they, they say, okay, we have these resources, we don't want to share these resources, but what are we going to do with the people, the people in the ghetto? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to do something with them. We can't just like drop a bomb on them. We can't go to like, drop a bomb on them, like Chicago. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
like even in American cities, like, you know, the, the real dying, okay? And so to say that schools are still better is to ignore the fact that, um, you know, we are prioritizing already, you know, some interests over others. Who are the schools better for? Yeah. Right, like all of these institutions that we really see are like destroying the earth, destroying human society, like the military, um, you know, things like Monsanto, the Wall Street, whatever the case may be, like these are very educated people. You know, these aren't like dummies. These are these, these people are highly educated. Yeah. Um, and that's something I was realizing that like uh, Oftentimes, I think we have a utopian vision of like what education is going to accomplish, but most of the time it seems to actually just further destruction and mayhem. That's usually what it's doing. It's not really bettering people. Maybe in our private lives, in our own like personal interactions, like we can discuss things in a better way. We can have better interactions, but like on a, on a macro scale, if we look on a macro scale, what's happening to the earth, like literally, we can see that the, the education system that we have now is basically reinforcing a lot of the problems that we're trying to get rid of through education or whatever, you know? Exactly. So. Yeah. yeah, I feel like they would be looked at as like good capitalists, like the leaders of Monsanto. They would be seen as being successful and they're actually what this entire education model is set up to produce at ultimately they succeeded in this education model. The fact that they are causing so much destruction around the entire world shows that there's something severely fucked up in our education system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge that it transmits, yeah. Um, yeah, um, so people have been kind of getting here and there about how, you know, like this discussion has been uh, basically like a radical sociological, anthropological critique of education, and that's awesome, but people will keep kind of bringing up, like, well, how do we use that analysis to develop uh, strategies for revolutionary pedagogy in education, you know, and uh, alternative models, um, so... Yeah, like I, I want to have a discussion about that um, because there's a reason why like slaves were killed when they learned how to read. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a reason why in the '60s, like thousands of young, poor youth of color were joining organizations like the Black Panthers and doing study groups of like Karl Marx and Lenin. And these like extremely sophisticated theories that are like, not easy to understand. Um, so. I'm interested in like what are like models that we can like develop or what are things that people already kind of are participating in now um, that can help us develop uh, educational models, pedagogy models that reject the bourgeois capitalist class framework. Um, and like I don't know, one simple thing that like I'm doing right now is just like study groups with young kids and like I know young kids who have dropped out of high school but they're still interested in reading Frank Fanon and Huey Newton. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, how do we develop a, a different model, you know, that totally is rejecting and understanding, like using this radical sociological or anthropological critique mm -hmm. and rejecting that model and developing our own, you know. And I think, yeah, like study groups amongst like working class youth, working class youth is like a way to, it's mm -hmm. a small thing, you know, but I mean, I know people have developed like alternative like educations and schools, um, so yeah, I'm kind of just like yeah. interested in that. Um, I mean, you already like in the critique. I mean, we do get glimpses mm -hmm. of if we have a problem, like where could we go? Well, Sasha mentioned, um, you know, the community farming okay, projects. Like that, that's one way um, of um, helping the kids relate in a different way to the life around them. Okay. Um, one thing I would caution is, yeah, maybe at the time when the slaves were killed for, for reading, the capitalization of knowledge was following like a, a specific prescriptive kind of, you know, who, who should and who shouldn't. But once they learn how to read, are the descendants not being still killed in school? Like, you know, we have... Um, you know, we're like even we we had a whole you know talk discussion on uh, Trayvon Martin. Um, they were like uh, you know all. I mean, they they still 
Okay. Or, not or not accident. Uh, yeah. People who, who can read now, like Obama, he's a good example. He's highly educated. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> you're, you're, you're educated, yeah. but uh, you know the mechanism that, that, we, that we live under. You know, I, I see what you're getting at, but we have to change. But we have to change the whole mechanism under which people are learning before we can get to like mm -hmm. a model where people want to learn and they're able to learn things that like nurture them and nurture revolution. But but we're not there right now. And how do we? Yeah, how do we get there? Is a, like an important question, but like. This is like one of the most important questions of our time because we have, if we don't solve it, like we're fucked. Like seriously, like seriously. Like, and there's a certain group is a really like especially like if, if you're in in the city, you know, um, discussing France Fanon, that's already a great thing. But obviously, on on its own, it's not going to. It's right. a communication from an experience mm -hmm. that's really important mm -hmm. in this respect. Yeah, like literacy has changed us, and we 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 still use it, you know. Um, but it's now it becomes a live, meaningful dialogue if you're sitting with people who are touched by this history, to whom this history is important, and you're having this discussion in conjunction to other ways of relating, of, of how can I be an agent of my space, but bringing it life instead of death. But this is what the education project is about, it's bringing us death. How are we going to undo that? How are we going to reclaim our life, our community, and what is our community? Yeah, I yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think, like, in creating an entirely revolutionary framework for education, we have to supplement that with other features that people would be going through schooling to get, like things like when you say, "Where if you don't go get educated, you're going to die," it's like because you can't afford health insurance, you can't. So many people need a car, so you can't afford car insurance. Like we would have to supplement the revolutionary education with those things that are going to provide the means of living and people to survive on their own, and then we can be able to live right ourselves. Too. But but that is part of the trap: is that uh, your means of living becomes, and this is what I talk about, um, handicap. Because the whole my critique of the invention of technology itself is to handicap us instead of. Focusing on community of life, we need artificial limbs. So the slaves become the limbs, the cars become the limbs, we can, the, the computers become our memory limbs, you see? So we become dependent. Instead of focusing on life, we focus on servitude and on using artificial limbs. So there's a danger, like how are we going to really unthink what is our livelihood? And this is why I want you to think of civilization and wildness. Wilderness is the space, wildness is the relationship. The, the subsistence culture. What is your subsistence? What do you eat? Okay? Are you in charge right. of so what you're going to eat? Like if yeah. we're able to be in charge of our own food, then we might be so dependent on yeah, Making a yeah. to be able to buy the food that we need. Okay, so this is, yeah. And the, and the medication and the... Right. Food. Yeah, okay, so then, yeah, it basically... Yeah. I missed maybe a word. Oh, okay. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, who... Are you moderating? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just responding to my daughter. Okay. Yeah. Um, who... Oh, no, sorry. I did want to say something. I was just trying to... Um, okay. I, on the, the, the sort of same thread of, of what you're talking about. I think that um, it's like, it's almost like a dangerous trap that people fall into. Um, I've had this conversation for like years with people, but like, it's like the chicken or the egg argument. So like, can we fix this one thing? So if we fix education, it doesn't necessarily mean that our society is gonna be fixed. And so if we fix our society, does it mean that, like, it's like, which one do you go for first? Like, it's like, what, what, like at what point do you start? Or like, what is the starting point? I think that that's, when, when you bring it back into like this idea of the system and as Lisa had said earlier, like what are children really meant to do? Like do we just walk into like an area and say, okay, so your school's really shit, you know, it's like not teaching you properly, let's go like, you know, plant fucking flowers and, and do this kind of thing. <laughs> but I mean like on a real practical basis, like it's really awesome that we're all sitting here and talking on a theoretical basis, but on a really practical down to earth basis, like that doesn't really help the communities that are suffering here, like, it's like, where is that starting point? Like, where do you begin to create that alternative? Or is it just a matter of 
forget about trying to create an alternative and create an awareness of, of, of what our reality is. I feel like um, our Twitter brought up the Black Panthers and that's what they tried to create is like they had an entire system, they were teaching kids philosophy, mm -hmm. they were teaching kids. I grew up in Ireland, yeah. so we had exactly the same like replication of, mm -hmm. of community learning and community teaching. Right. But so I feel like that's the place, like that's where we can start. It's just like they were a threat to the government, so they all got killed. Yeah. Exactly. You see, it constantly comes back to that the minute you're threatening this parasitic system, you know, exactly. <laughs> so how, how do we do that? Because even from my background, like I'm from Belfast, like one of my best friends was just released from prison today. She spent two years in solitary confinement as a 60 year old woman, no charge, no trial, no nothing, just for that reason, because mm -hmm. she speaks out against the establishment and the status quo, so it's, it's easier just to put her away and not, you know, under lock and key. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you begin, because that is exactly what happened to the Black Panthers, and if we all decided tomorrow, if the entire community of Philadelphia decided tomorrow, that's what they were going to base their school system on, and this is what we were going to do to make like our world a better place, you better goddamn believe that we'd all be fucking killed too. Right. Do you know what I mean? So that's the reality. Yes, You'll only be tolerated for as long as you don't actually have any power to, uh, you know, to like put weight on their scales, like, and, and when you do, you'll be eradicated. So, like, that's also. Uh, uh, I got so many, like, oh, the emotion. But that's the first point. I mean, I'm sorry, like, I'm not trying to jump for anybody, but that's the yeah. first step is getting people to realize that they don't have a choice. Like, if you either go with the system or you die. But there is really no choice. And once more people realize that, I think then we'll start seeing some more solutions because we'll have more minds like thinking about And this looking at the way. root of it, exactly. Like, what is I the root? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess on a different tag, like a, a particular thing we're talking about with the solution is like, I think we're all looking for like a big solution, but what we've been saying, like, yeah, we could all have study groups where we all be kind of like, that would still be. Any, any big solution, anything that tries to encompass everyone is still obligatory, like even if you're all reading or you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think it's really hard to talk about like how do we be inclusive, but how do we also not be um, like dictatorial. And like, we're, like, I don't think that the education system has failed me, so how do I tell these kids now, like, oh, like, I got mine, like, you guys, like, I'm going to teach you to read, I know I'm, like, in this study group instead of, and, you know, instead of working to, to, I don't know. Oh, no, I mean, I just, I read this book, called well, Grace Lee Boggs talks about this in her book, um, Sustaining Black in the 21st Century, which is about, like, at, like, as an alternative, teaching kids to, like, like, their education, the point of their education should be to make their world better, and, like, learning through um, like a more community-based kind of model and like your edu the service of your education is to um, improve yourselves and the lives of those around you. So yeah, I mean, but I, I think that is like a, that is like a diverse grassroots kind of model that isn't in a position. Um, um, yeah, I want you to, to still keep questioning the concept of education, what, like, you're talking about still as a body of knowledge, and that it should be, uh, you should teach the kids, so, um, you know, question what is that body of knowledge, question what, like, why should anyone, like, you already make, not you personally, but once you have the concept of education, you have to have a concept of humanity, like an anthropology. Okay, and what is the concept of humanity if you assume that kids need education? So that. But at the same time, like, how do you have confidence in your own convictions and your own beliefs if you don't, if you're not like reading what other people have thought, if you're not like? I'm not. I mean, I'm not talking about not interacting with us, not learning. I'm talking about teaching, you see, mm. this is this is the problem. Like the teaching is the problem. You know, what do you as like what do you need as a premise in order to have that concept that education is needed, you see? Yeah.
I, I actually found um, alluding to alluding to what you were saying to probably what you were saying, um, Mom, what you were saying, and Alice, what you were actually saying before. Um, my, I, I think um, what helped me most um, in in school, um, uh, in compulsory education and in college, were the were courses that um, were were, were, te were teachers um, would. Um, introduce a balance between um, practical le learning, objective learning, and methods of creative thinking, and encouraging, um, encouraging, and um, getting each person to think for him or herself independently. And I and I actually found that I I got the most out of that in in, ter in, ter in terms of uh, teaching. Um, method that I responded to. I, mean, I know everybody's a little bit different with that, but that's what spoke to me. And not too long ago, um, and, and that, that concerns teaching methods, and in terms of the support for education and, and establishing a um, foundational framework for how to be able to uphold it and implement it, there was, there was a rally actually a couple years ago in um, Harrisburg Capital about education um, funding, fair, fair education funding. And one thing that one of the speakers ended with, which, which I, th I thought made it incredibly effective, was he encouraged you to talk to your legislators, to your, your sen senators, and, and, let, and let, them, let them know um, what with what effectively works on, 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 on a personal level and and, and alluding to and alluding to the community as well, and so the, those those are just those are just a couple of key points that um, that I thought of. I agree with part of it, but the last part about the legislators I don't agree with. So, you know, they have their own agenda that's probably not for everyone. They're probably only supporting a certain narrow. That I do agree that like the, the diversity, I think is important. I may, may mention this, and I think that's a really important point. Like we don't all have to learn in the same way, and I think that's what the system we're living under now is telling us. Like we all go to school, we all sit in the classroom, and the teacher stands in front, we sit at this. Like we're all taught to do that. Like it's something we can learn. And I, I wanted to bring Luba into this. This is uh, this is Layla's daughter, and she is homeschooled or unschooled. And I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, if people want to ask her questions about her experience, like how she learns and what she's learning, what she's learning, I think that would be a good way to like, actually bring this into a concrete, you know, realm, but not just look so abstract, you know. And actually, in the book, I have entries of my uh, from my journal, um, my discussions. Like she's almost a co-author. <laughs> Um, <laughs> on the discussions and, and how she sees the world and how she learns and, and um, you know, without anyone really teaching her anything. Like, never taught her how to read or write or, or math. She learned how to count when we were stuck hitchhiking in the north of Russia. And no car would pick us up. She was a year and she was like, one car, two <laughs> <laughs>
relates to the word grinder does really depends on how I do and how I imparted how my experiences are onto her. And she is not unschooled, rather just taught to challenge every bullshit that she hears in school. And, you know, she's quite a well-rounded kid. She's quite an intelligent kid, just like that can sit and talk and has done from she was like a little kid. Like, we had a Palestinian solidarity campaign meeting one night and had the Syrian government officials over to talk about how we could get medical aid from Ireland into Syria. And so, the West Bank, blah, 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 and we were there to discuss this, and the next thing they were all sitting talking to like the six-year-old child because they were like amazed that she knew what Palestine was or what Israel was, or she's like this tiny little red-headed Irish kid. It's like, hi, what are you? So like, they spent the whole time like talking. No, they were just that they were kind of like taken aback that like the child was like politicized or was able to like talk on the same level as they were able to. So. I mean, her going through the education system, I don't necessarily see as like a disadvantage. I feel like she's like learned way more going through the system, but having parents that are like completely anti authoritarian and totally anti the system. So, <laughs> um, not that it's like, but I don't think that it's been a complete detriment to her life for her to have been through the actual system. I'm not sure about the whole college thing, though I think that might work. Yeah, but it seems like you aim work. for her to occupy like um, a certain comfortable niche in the predatory chain. So um, anyone who's below that, obviously, school has failed. And this was my point from the beginning: is that um, in a way, um, all of us, um, our interests are vested. Like we, since we invest ourselves so much in keeping this system and this chain of predation that no matter where we find ourselves since as long as we we still have resources to exploit and abuse below us then we feel well the system has not really failed like it's uncomfortable it's unpleasant it's abusive but we can close our eyes to it um, the fact that rape is rampant like the, the rape statistics in civilization, the health detriment of, uh, you know, like in every ag agrarian and civilized society, the first thing that happens, fertility rates and the health of women plummet. Okay, so fertility rates go up, the health goes down. And, and still, we are being sold the package that, um, but without that, it will be worse. But it actually is, it is worse. Worse. Yeah, exactly. I get that. And so, um, yeah, on an individual level, but maybe you know the system has not failed you or not completely or you know. Um, but, I, but, but globally, it has failed us because, like the species extinction, the acidification of the oceans, the melting of the, the you know the North and South Poles. Um, the deforestation, the diseases, the death, the death, the wars, and the death, you know? Like, it has failed us. I, I, just, I don't yeah. think that it hasn't failed, and I, I'm yeah. not trying to like be supportive of like the, this idea of the system. My point really comes back to what I believe as a parent is that like there, there has to be either a communal responsibility or like the, the exactly. responsibility that this yeah. idea that education can only yeah. happen by a school is bullshit. So that's, yes, yeah. maybe that's our starting point. Maybe that's an awesome starting point to bring back and, 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 and my, from a very early age. You know? and, and I suggest that like with, with this workshop that uh, not only you question and redefine knowledge civilization, but community. Because if, once you start seeing that we are trapped in this pr predation chain, that we don't have to do that, that, and we can get out of that predatory cycle and start relating to diversity of life, like you find that you immediately start engaging in relationships of wildness. You know? Your community becomes much more varied and alive and much more um, emotionally, you know, emotionally satisfying. So it's healing to have that. 
And so, yeah, redefinition of community and an action on how, because of course, like, you know, mentioned uh, the minute the Black Panthers, the minute it's, it, or, you know, Ireland, it's danger, you know, someone is going to. Uh, we're almost, we're running out short of time, yeah, yeah. so I'm going to get straight in there, but then I also want to get through yeah, this thing okay. because, and I want to say, Anya, I think your daughter is amazing. I met her, and I think she's like actually a one rare exception. You know what I mean? Not, you know, <laughs> That's like, you, know, you talk to me about like what you went through to get her to the school. Yeah. And your own story is unique. And but you know, that's an exception. Yeah. You, know, you know how those kids are. So. Yeah. Um so let's so go strike and then you live me for maybe wrap it up. So. Um yeah, uh, my my concern generally in pretty much all of radical organizing is that there's a lot of flash in the darkness going on. Like, and I don't think there's enough attention paid to like how we make it so that they're not just like, uh, so they're not just flashes, so that they're like that whole fire that consumes the existing world. And I think when you have, when you want to, we, what we have to do is create a systemic shift. And I think a systemic shift requires a systemic approach. And I think uh, we also have to like really uh, act as, we have to proceed as if this is not just a philosophical thing, it's also a political thing. And so what I'm saying is that there are certain uh, references. Yeah. yeah. We have we have there are certain things we have to do now or that we have to do like post haste or whatever that we wouldn't do if we didn't have to contend with it. If we didn't have this systemic shift. Mm -hmm. Like the whole idea of not like teaching the youth as if with our own uh, our own agenda, like that is ide that ideally that's what happens. But right now we mm -hmm. need, we do need to reproduce ourselves as right. like uh, yeah. as a opposition to the existing world. So we can't we can't really let it just be. Yeah, but if you, I I totally agree with you. But the problem is that a lot of the people who have gone through all this radicalization and then put their kids in school or like have to deal with other kids in school who are domesticated and civilized, then it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you're, you're losing that because, you know, they have to deal with the same things, the same pain, and the situation is actually like, radically urgent, yeah. yeah. I guess I'm going to say about, yeah. before we get to her, like, your point about that, like, when you say systemic, I agree, but it can't be, like, we're all actually uh, the same yeah. drama. Like, we have to attack the problem from different angles, and we need many, like, that's why I put diversity on this board, like, and if we're going to beat this problem, mm -hmm. we can't be coming in, like, we're uh, the Black Panthers with one system, and we all have to do it that way, because the government will come and squash that. Or, like Anya said, in her country, uh, they, start, they tried to do something and, and implement it that way. The government came to squash that. We have to have many different things going on at once, I think, if we're going to Absolutely. win this place. It still comes to a system, that's what I'm saying. Like, right. Whether right. there's a plurality in the system, yeah. it, like, there should be a plurality, but like, it shouldn't be a uh, yeah, not some, some tactical. Yeah, it should be tactics, right? It should yeah. be like, just an energy. Yeah, it should be strategic yeah. 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 exactly. tactics, exactly. not just yeah. random yes. tactics yes. that we want to be. Yes. Right. Tactics that contribute to our collective right. goals. That's right. my point, but it has to be. Yes. There's a, there we have a goal, and you have to organize towards that goal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I don't know if I'm going to ask you specific questions. You may be coming still here, maybe. You know? Okay. I feel like I've been like, left off the circle. Um, is there anything in general that you want to say about your experience <laughs> learning that you think, like, you, you play with other, with other uh, young people your own age? Like, yeah. You, you, you have friend, you're friends with kids who are at school. Maybe you can start by talking about the differences that you see and how you learn versus how they learn and how do you notice a difference or do you Yeah, I do notice a difference. But I'd just like like, like to say um I think that like the whole like, I like the idea of the school. It's just that it needs a lot of work. Like how you actually deliver the information. Because like not everyone has the same information and like you should try to educate other people just like in a better way. And to answer your question, yeah, I do feel like it's different. Like I do learn it in a different way. Um, there's more kind of like freedom of choice, kind of. Um, but yeah, 
Like it, it's less violent. Like uh, if my mom doesn't like force me to like learn anything, I just like really want to learn it. How, how old were you? Like how many languages do you speak actually? I was a teacher. And so kind of French. Russian and English. And like how old were you when you first speaking these languages? Like, uh, well, Russian is my mother language. Like I've spoken with Russian my whole life. Um, I started speaking English when I was, at, when, when I was actually living in Pennsylvania. I would like walk around everywhere with like a dictionary and like talking to people using a dictionary. Um, yeah. So like when you want to learn something, how do you approach that? Like, let's say there's a topic you discover and you say, well, I really, you know, want to learn about that. How do you tackle that without any kind of structure or something saying? Um, there are like other sources of information that you get schools. Like there are books, like there's the internet. Um, and there's always like you can also go up to people and ask them like I know that you know like, a lot about this topic. Can you just help me with like, I'm trying to learn more about it? Like usually like I come up to my friends and like I really want to know like about this and this and this. Such like, as um such as let's say math. Like that happens a lot. Um so my my mom or my dad are like um like what do you want to know? What do you already know? So like, I don't have to repeat myself. And it's less violent in schools. Like schools like um you don't have any like any input into like, what exactly you want to learn. Do you feel like you can share how, um, for example, in topics that we don't know, how, other, say that like how other professors help you? Are they helpful? Are they welcoming? Like, because people who are passionate usually like, they just like want to share, right? So what happens? Um, when I was about like seven, or eight. I was living in Pennsylvania for a bit with my mom. Um, and I was really interested in artificial intelligence, so like robots, programming. Um, and she had access to um, to the university, to the Mar College. So I told her, like, hey mom, I do really want to like to know how it all works. Can you please help me? And so she took me to Renoir College to like the We actually wrote a message, <laughs> remember? Um no. you know? <laughs> <laughs> with the dictionary like until three in the morning she was composing the letter. Yeah, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Okay, good. Um so you wrote that letter and then you went to the to professor who I didn't know, just like uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just I I would like go there with my little dictionary. Um, and like looking back at it, I'm surprised. Like even though he he works in like in a field where like you have to pay uh, to get that information. He was so willing to share it with me because I actually like, really wanted to learn to learn about artificial intelligence. <laughs> and he invited her to the lab with the, you know college students and they worked on the robots and and then her English started picking up and then she asked questions. Well, if artificial intelligence works like this, how does you know, animal intelligence, like, so it took her to, like, on other tangents that she explored. But without that system that we're criticizing Jenna Britton so much, she would never have known that because she did not have a resource at a college, she didn't have a professor, so even with that, this actual system aided in, the, I don't yeah. think that, I mean, the no, existence no, no. of I, I, I agree and that's an you. extremely privileged, like, I agree with place you. to be at, you know, to be able to, like, like, there's, like, if you go across the road, like, you're guaranteed parents wouldn't have the, the that position or whatever. Absolutely, so. I agree with you. And, um, um, well, it happened, like, in several universities where 
you know, we didn't know anyone. Um, and the professors responded, usually, like, you know, maybe one was traveling, so he said, like, I, I couldn't, but usually, you know, they were always, you know, fascinated okay. and amazed. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but it's true that, you know, because we have um, that um, um, attitude to knowledge that, okay, if you want it, you go and get it, but of course, like, people who've been trained in school that you only get what is delivered, what, and you are rationed that knowledge and rationed that information, of course they don't have it. But that's precisely the role of our communities is to share that information and to say, oh, you know, you want to learn, like, no, you, you want to learn about how tomatoes grow? Well, you know, you know, you can find out, like, what do, chem like, chemistry, what do chemicals do to the soil? Okay, there were other, like, history, how did the indigenous populations here tend gardens that kept the wilderness and diversity? Okay, 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 okay. Exactly. Yeah, and so it's, it's, it's part of that revolutionizing, one of the tactics of revolutionizing that access to knowledge and sharing it with people who don't have it, you know, and because otherwise, yeah, you know, they, they don't know what's there. If you don't know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. From what I kind of heard, like, heard from what you were saying, it was more like for you, like, being able to, like, think of something like artificial intelligence or math or robotics or, or why are things blue or whatever the heck it would have been and it was more like a willingness to learn as opposed to like as we've talked about like all night like a, an oppressive like dictatorial system that's telling you this is what you need to learn like do you find that that aids you now as you're trying to like look at things in the world like in a more in-depth or how like you know, A comp you know, affects B and I come you know how is that like helped you and yeah. kind of being able to like research like your the information that you want or um yeah because I think like, like, I I actually don't see like the Subjects that require empathy and compassion. 
profession, yeah. which is like your separate example. It is like medical, like uh, for example, uh, I two or three years ago, um, in a, like a couple of years in a row, uh, because I'm a member of a Yahoo groups uh, unschooling in Canada, and uh, uh, a university in Ontario. I think one of the, the really good universities in Ontario. Uh, we're recruiting from that group uh, for the medical profession because uh, they said like the unschoolers are uh, disciplined and when they relate, they relate through empathy. So their knowledge is not like simply abstract formula, but it's like what is being needed now and so it's also not regurgitation. It's like, exactly. it's like not like exactly. because I feel like that's all. This yeah. country's education system is like yeah. really awful. And then, like, <laughs> of course, what I'm talking about, like education, is um, TJ. Oh, TJ. Yeah, one second. What I'm talking about, like, obviously, it's the school. Like at this age, she's 14, and she feels she does need more structured centers. And you know, again, like I'm not talking about, you know demolishing all knowledge, but it's our attitude to what is in that knowledge, to our access to that knowledge, and to how to make it accessible to everyone. In Europe, there were like the, the free universities, and like one of my best experiences with learning were actually at Bryn Mawr and at this university, École des Hautes Études Sciences Sociales. Bryn Mawr is very expensive, so they recruit like minorities and you know, people, but you know, it's still like, like the financial aid will not cover like a revolution, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you were going to get this from her. But, yeah, the Collège de France, like, think of it. Collège de France is a system where you don't have to get tested, you don't have exams. Everyone is free to come and attend the lectures when they want, participate in the labs. It's completely open in Brussels. There's also like a free university. So, you know, I'm not saying like throw everything out the window, but, you know, re redo it, undo it, and reshuffle it. Like, you know, so, TJ, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to know if anybody was aware of the independent project. No. It's, uh, it sounds a lot like um, your education. It's, it was started by a high school student in Massachusetts where he just basically convinced his school to allow him and a cohort of students, I think like 11 other students, to for uh, either a semester or a year, for a semester I believe it was, to allow them to independently study um, any anything that they wanted in the different areas. So they did math, science, reading, and history the way, you know, mm -hmm. but they just put, picked their project for the semester and they went and so like some students had to leave campus every day to go and mm -hmm. you know talk to somebody who was an uh, expert in that field and learn from them, etc. And they just they that's what they did every day and got uh, and they didn't do any other classes. They that was they taught themselves. They didn't have any teachers who um, and they did this in a public school in Massachusetts. It's called the Independent Project. You, you can look it up on the internet. Yes. And, uh, my child's school district does it for every single senior. Okay. Um, that's what she just spent the last three, like the last two months doing. Only she chose homelessness in Philadelphia and like that. That was up to her. She was just like. When did they start this project? I think like three years ago. Okay, so it's new because uh, John Taylor Gatto actually was fired because he tried to do something similar in New York. <laughs> That's like the school I went to in Massachusetts. It was, it was an elementary school, yeah, but like, um, it was all project based work. So, like, we would like, decide how, how we would work. Like, I guess my favorite example is like, we learned how to measure by like um, designing a house for like itself. So we decided to build furniture. So, we like, would build furniture and like, measure things that way. Yeah, that's in Massachusetts. Yeah, I mean, the, they have like they do a video and everything, and it's awesome because they they would start off each week with a, like they just come in with questions, that's and then crazy. they would help each other like um, narrow down the question and refine the question, and then they would these were high school students. But how do you know what grade? Uh, I don't know. No, okay. Um, I, I, it was like nine to twelve. I think it was a mixture. Oh, so that's kind of awesome. And um, they. 
uh, they, they would spend the rest of the week just researching the answer to that question. And then on the Friday, on Friday they would then present like to the rest of the week mm -hmm. the answer to their question. I just want to let people know before we get out that I have seven copies of the latest book. So if you want to get it from me and I have to pay like the shipping costs, I would highly recommend it. This is what it looks like. So it's not like super long. Um, and it's really, it goes deeper into our critiques of civilized education. It, it does give some ways forward to what we can do. But basically, the, the, the book is deconstructing how we view education and showing that why it's not as benign, um, just like passive, that, you know. Um, so that's why I put that out there so you can share your books. I want to thank you all for coming. This is a really good discussion. Thank you. 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 Thank you.